Okay. So we, we have with us today, Brian Warner, who created Facade. And Facade is the tool that we use to uh, build all of our repository commit data. So everything about the people who make commits and the number of commits they've made by week, month, and year are calculated using uh, a derivative, um, which is why the agenda item is beautiful, wonderful, terrible things that we've done. Um, so Brian's program uh, ran extremely fast in MySQL and essentially broke down commits uh, into a very nice summary for folks. And what we've done with that data, I think two things I'd like folks to understand about how we have uh, maybe caused harm to Brian uh, in the way he thinks about it. But the way we got our heads around Facade is we divided it up into eight cleverly named libraries numbered from zero to seven <laughs> that uh, contain the broken apart logic inside Brian's uh, Facade worker at the Brian Warner slash Facade project. And we did that mostly for our own understanding and also because we rewrote it to talk to a Postgres database and mm -hmm. populate a schema of our own design. Okay. Which, which is available um, on, on our, in our repository. And some of the biggest changes are, you, Brian, had a table called analysis data, which was where the commits were stored. And we called that table commits. Mm -hmm. And by breaking out these different methods, we, we've essentially created classes. So you probably don't recognize um, like I'm basically we're importing a bunch of things that are in these subdivided programs and everything is in a class now, which I don't think you divided things into in your original program if I'm right. That's correct. And that lets us essentially decompose and manage each of the different core tasks that Facade performs uh, separately. So config is reasonably stable. The utility methods are very stable because that's how we count the commits and update the logs. Uh, analysis is very stable. How we clean things up and um, rebuild the cache, those things have changed a bit simply because we have a different schema. Mm -hmm. But and, and the one, I think, significant feature we've added uh, and had been taken away, it's still in development, is now we reconcile the email addresses that are generated from facade repositories with any GitHub user IDs that we've gathered from issue data. So when we, we pull all the GitHub ID information down from GitHub, we can check to see if the email that we get from Facade exists on GitHub and then populate that user's GitHub information as well. And when we have multiple email addresses that return the same GitHub user ID, we're able to create aliases for users automatically. Neat. Yeah, so that is, I think, the, a, the summary of, of how the engine of Facade has been sort of you can look at it uh, as a good thing or a bad thing. Um, Sounds like a great thing. Uh, some of the things we've done, so the basic, the fundamental data that's displayed on this page, you can also find in Facade. Um, the top 10 committers are listed. All this is, as many, many of you know, uh, in a RESTful API. We've also provided some visualizations that show the overall amount of committing that each of the top 10 folks has done over time. So here it's easier to visually see that Habad at bestest.com on the Zephyr repository has been a more recent committer and a pretty extensive one. The, the um, up and down kind of in the middle are lines added, lines removed for that particular user. Mm -hmm. And then we can see the top 10 users also visualized in terms of their contributions over time. And if I hover over a person, I can just see um, at that moment in time, what was, you know, what are their commits or net lines added and total lines changed for, for different people. So uh, it's, a, it's a lot more visual. Um, the other thing we can do is we can compare a facade data. We can compare repositories with each other. This is um, going to be interesting because I don't know if this, uh, I don't know if I've got this completely populated. So I'm just going to try to pick a repo that I think might have some data in it. And right now, oops, 
and something went horribly wrong. You may not have data for that repo. Moving right along. <laughs> if I go and look at this other repo, and I also want to look at the Apache group, maybe I'll have better luck there, or maybe I broke it. Um, yeah, there, maybe there's not data for those. Um, so HBase and Hadoop should have stuff to compare. What are you trying to show, Sean? I'm just trying to show repo comparison, but I realize that the only la labels we have right now for repo comparison are issues, right? Yeah. Issues. So some of these don't have issues. So I'm going to skip ahead and say we do issue comparison and we're adding commit comparisons. And this has been a core feature of Augur for, for a long time. Um, um. Sean, what are you doing for the commit comparisons? What what is it that you're attempting to show there when you um, when you do get it implemented? For the for the commit comparisons, we have we have two um, two ways that we look at it. Um, these are the net lines of code added down here, and these are the net lines of code visualized. Mm -hmm. We can also show total commits. We don't have a visualization uh, for that right now, but it's yeah, but we, yeah, we, we're planning on a pie chart that would show basically all of the authors who are responsible for 50% or more of the commits or up to 50% of the commits, and then the rest of the authors or committers would be shown um, in, the, in the larger, hopefully, pie chart. So it would give you kind of a real quick visual of the bus factor for a project. If you had mm -hmm. a number of folks that were involved in 50% or more of the code, that's a better feeling than like if that pie chart is one person. Gotcha. Uh, and so that's the, that's kind of one of our next visualizations that we're working Ryan, on. Ryan, was your question about comparison though too? It was about comparison. Yeah. I was just kind of curious. Um, I can maybe understand looking at um, uh, issues and doing comparisons against you know, one project versus, or one, one repo versus another and, and figuring out maybe activity and things like that. I was just curious when you're comparing commits from one project versus commits for another, are you looking for overlaps between them or what, what specifically are you looking for and trying to achieve? So there's two comparisons that we'll make and it's a line chart when it shows up, if I, if I were to pick the two right repos, it shows essentially a time series of mm -hmm. the number of total commits um, in the project as a whole, and then it compares the number of total commits in the other project. So if you're, we also have when that works, we can show uh, a Z score as well. So if you have two projects with significantly different gross activity, then you can sort of normalize it and just see the patterns um, relative high and low across the repository. So if you're comparing Ruby with Augur, Augur doesn't look as tiny with the Z score. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, yeah, and we have the endpoints um, that we have available um, are in a. I think we have this from our. So can I ask a question, Sean? Yeah. So there were okay. So maybe two questions. So you had said that there were two things to do compete commit comparisons on. One was time series of total commits in the project as a whole. What was the second one? Um, sorry, say that again, Matt. So you had said um, that there were two ways that you were showing commit comparisons. One was comparisons on time series of total commits. Right. We can also show by line of code. OK. So we could compare yeah, like time series. Yeah. Go ahead. Is it a time series? Yes. And okay. so, so there's a lot more data underneath Augur than we have shown in the front end right now. And if you want to understand the data that's available, you can look at the, um, the basically the API docs. I assume you can z-score the lines of code as well. Yes. Yes. 
And then can you, on the, the total commits and the lines of code, can you just give the rationale for why you would even want to do a comparison of commits between two projects or why you would, and why you would want to do a comparison between lines of code? So the, the I think the Z-score is more useful. Okay. I, I think if you're, the assumption is typically that you're comparing these things in projects that you're familiar with. So the projects that one's going to load into Augur are projects that they are either following, or monitoring, or trying to understand the cycle of. Mm -hmm. And when they're trying to make sense of growth, maturity, and decline in a project, seeing where and how often there are peaks in the lines of code or the commits on a project gives you a sense of the rhythm of the project and the relative trajectory of types of contribution. So if I see a lot of total lines of code on one project, but I see a lot of lines removed, that might indicate, like, if the total includes both a lot of lines removed and a lot of lines added, that might indicate a significant refactoring. Mm -hmm. If it's just lines being added, that suggests to a lot of people, I think, a set of features are being added to a project. So if I can look at two projects I'm familiar with or perhaps competing against side by side, I can look at over the life of those projects, kind of how their rhythm has has compared with each other. And so if, I, if I'm looking, I think it's, and also if I think there's maybe something happening on a project or not happening, it can give me some quantitative information to draw a comparison with that project's own history. Okay. So on this topic, I was thinking this through, there are a couple of fairly powerful insights that I think could be drawn from this that are fairly useful. I'm glad to hear you talking about this because this, this looks like it'd be really a useful direction to take the project. One of the things that I dealt with in the open source programs office um, was when one project ended or when one project was on its last legs and a certain number of committers or, or contributors moved over to a new one. Right. And this happens uh, on one hand, it'll happen when there's a fork uh, but it also happens when a company has changed their strategy dramatically and has decided that for whatever reason, whether it's governance, licensing, or whatever, uh, they decide that they're going to move away from the old one. And having some level of comparison that allows you to compare who was active in one project and is now active in the other, and when that's, you know, when that's happened for a fair number of the people who are responsible for the core of the project, you can pretty conclusively say, the old project's dead. And yeah. that would be a very useful thing to be able to, uh, to see and probably something that you could pull out from the data that you already have. Yeah, we can certainly pull out when, when people stop contributing to a project. So well, and, and more than that, which project they've gone to. Um, we had some issues. So for example, if, if you have multiple companies who have uh, joint development agreements, where you have, um, you know, say, they say, okay, well, we're going to try and work on this project and build this thing up. Um, and then, you know, you see a, a company start to step away from that. Uh, it can be helpful to know where they've gone, to know whether it's just uh, they've reassigned the people and they're just not working on anything related to it, or if another project is getting more momentum and that's something you should be considering as well. That can be a useful bellwether when you're getting to the late stages of a project. That's a great, that's a great point. Uh, and one of the, one of the things that GitHub, so one of the things the GitHub API would allow us to do, and we've talked about doing is, is kind of a focus, but we've talked about a, a large scale snowball sample of getting a list of the repos that all the contributors to a particular project also contribute to, and then looking at the movement of people across projects over time. Mm -hmm. so that I think what you're describing but in a more focused way, because I think your question is mostly about probably the top contributors. So, yes, yes. So, so you, what you don't want is to be making a multi-year bet on a project, which is in the process of being abandoned. And sometimes, you know, again, this is probably, this is the exception rather than the rule, healthy projects, hopefully grow and adapt over time. But sometimes you end up with a situation where somebody decides to fork something. And then the question that you face 
when you're looking at your development strategy is, do I stay with mainline or do I go with the fork? And that's a very, very difficult question to answer. Uh, but one of the one of the ways you can tell is essentially where's all the activity gone? Um, you know, the fork may have gotten some initial traction. People may have been interested in it in a while, but the core contributors are still working in, in mainline. Is, is, you know what I'm the, the, when this happens in your experience, does the, does, the, does the fork, it sounds like these are forks that, do they exist as forks on GitHub that sort of are forks of the project now by themselves in perpetuity? Or do they fork and detach and become another project? Yeah, so I'm talking about hostile forks that detach yeah. completely. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are multiple high profile projects where for whatever reason the community has forked. And you know, that, that's one of those difficult questions when you're looking at a, at a product pipeline that's going out a few years, you don't want to pick the wrong one. Or at least you want to use the best of the information that you have available to choose the one that you think is probably going to win based upon where everybody else is. So it's, it's not, so I think, I think this is kind of interesting because it would mean you want to try to follow top contributors and see where they've gone and they disappear. Yes, if you, are, if you are banking on the economics of the open source development model, you kind of have to do that. Yeah. Because otherwise you find yourself maintaining something that nobody else is paying attention to anymore. You become, you know, the, the monarch of a very small domain. Monarch of the West. Brian, <laughs> does, this, does this include identifying the actual people or is it just about activity? You could probably tease it out based upon activity. I mean, every patch that comes in has an author and a committer. Yeah. You look and see who the committer is. And you could, you could essentially argue that the people who are responsible for the majority of commits in a project are probably the ones who are in a decision-making capacity. Yeah. And the people who are in a decision-making capacity are probably there because they know the project inside and out and they're largely responsible for its long-term stability. When those people go, or when a significant number of people who are responsible for a significant number of commits go, then there's a hollowing out of expertise. Yep. And that can be a sign that the project is, you know, it may stay stable for a while, but there may be better things happening elsewhere. Makes and this sense. is, I, this would probably yeah. be useful, not, not as a broad survey, like let's look at all of GitHub and figure out where everybody's gone. I need a bigger uh, server. <laughs> bigger, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, but, but maybe more, you know, when, when you get that tactical question um, from, you know, somebody who's in product strategy who says, well, do we use component X or do we use component Y? Y appears to be X, but people have started working on that. Does it have enough momentum yet? You know, can we trust it? Is it going to go away or is the old one still going to get updates? It, it helps answer that very specific targeted question, uh, which is why it's nice to see, you know, that you're able to compare one, you know, just two repos against each other. That would be sufficient for answering this question. Mm-hmm. And this is all under the assumption what you're describing that these people trying to understand this know what those two repos are. There's yes. Not yeah, that's right. I mean, oftentimes it, you look at the, the development planning sessions and people kind of have to figure out what features are we going to roll in and when are we going to sync our, you know, our in-house fork with upstream and, and all those questions. And that's when these things arise. Okay, cool. That it, it's a very, I mean, these, this is a, a worst case scenario type question to ask, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I can, it comes up though. It does. Well, it comes up and it's a very difficult question to answer because in the absence of data, it's just sort of feel, well, people on the mailing list are really upset. <laughs> you know? yeah. Uh, yeah. It seems like this person hasn't been around for a while. Uh, there's a lot of press about this new fork, which, you know, maybe that's true and maybe it's not. And we have the data at our fingertips here to be able to say activity has moved or activity has not. The people who are making the main decisions or writing the most code have moved or they have not. That's really great. Those are, I mean, I think uh, Carter and Gabe here are kind of nodding and going, yeah, <laughs> we should do that. Um, they're two of the main developers, um, if not the two main developers on the project right now. So Nice. So would you, in this case, Brian, would you want to be able to identify, like if I look at this screen that Sean is showing right here, I can't quite read the name of the top one, somebody at Lenaro, it looks like. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would yeah, you want to be able to identify that they were in the, they were in the other repository at one point, but now they appear to be, or do you think, and now they appear to be in this, this, this hostile fork, 
Or do you think there's enough institutional knowledge inside of a company that they could parse that out? I think what would be useful would be to at least put up the, put up what you can draw from the, <laughs> the conclusions that you can draw from the statistics and leave the interpretation to others. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, for example, something that would be useful thinking of it visually would be uh, an area graph time series where you have a specific person that shows the percentage of their commits or maybe the raw number of their commits that went into one project. And then in a different color, the number of commits went into the other. If you see something where, you know, it's essentially the same size line going across or the same size area going across for project A and project B is tiny, well, then you can reasonably conclude that project B is just a hobby for the person. Right. But if you notice that suddenly they've gone from doing the bulk of their work visually, the bulk of their work in project A to project B, you can probably conclude they're not caring very much about project A anymore. Okay. They may have maintenance responsibilities or whatever. There are nuances, of course, and that's where you would need to go back to people who are involved in the project and, and see what's going on. But um, that would be a, a reasonably clear signal that you could show that would allow somebody to at least know that there's a question they need to ask. And this would be a person by person question. Yeah. So this, I, I mean, this is something that if you show it for every developer, it will get overwhelming. Right. But, but there may be people who you can say based upon you know some predefined metric, whether it's the top 10 the people who are responsible for the top 10 uh, commits by, you know, by volume in the project or whatever. Okay. That makes sense. Anyone might even be just whoever makes up the bus factor for a project. And Say so that again. Whoever's in that bus, whoever in that bus factor, that, that top 10 or the top 15 yeah. committers, if their attention changes, mm -hmm. that, that's a signal. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I like the idea of uh, graph somehow where you can see the relationships and uh, just because uh, I thought of it, I was looking at the chaos project and the graph of contributors and um, repositories. And if I look in the past, it's uh, two, two graphs or two trees come up. But if I look at the more recent contributions, it's much more intermeshed and integrated. And I think that is a case where we can already see how the chaos project coming together from two different sides, the metrics and the software side is becoming more integrated. Mm -hmm. cool. Sure. So that's, that's great. I really appreciate um, Brian's thoughts on that. that. Those are, that gives us like more work to do. So thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Um, uh, there's a couple, are, are there other questions or ideas that people have based on just sort of seeing things in the interface or, or other general questions or ideas? I did create an agenda, but I don't have to um, stick with it. No, I, I, I mean, I agree. What Brian brought, what you're bringing forward, Brian, is I think is a different use case than I've heard before. So that's cool. But it's, it, it's, a, it's a pessimistic use case. I, I will. <laughs> it's a risk. It's a risk management use case, Brian. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah, that's a risk metric right there. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, and with that segue, I'm gonna nice. show. I'm gonna show off some of the work that Matt Snell at the University of Nebraska Omaha has done using the project formerly known as DoSox, which I think we now call Augur Dash SBOM for Software Bill of Materials, not Sean. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> uh, we have we have a short history of the four counts by week because we only started collecting it for this particular instance back in August, like less than a month ago. But there's been a so this is the Zephyr Projects risk page, and we use Dusox slash Augur SBOM to uh, I'm sorry Matt Snell did that to scan all the repos and identify all of the it, I think Matt's on the call Matt. Do you, I believe these are the declared licenses. Yeah, these are licenses that were found in declarations or um, kind of tech scraping on the files from the repository. Okay, I mean, a little soft, but yeah, Matt was, Matt was saying these are the licenses that were declared um, when you scrape through every file on the repository. So you have a nice inventory of all of the different licenses that exist inside of the Zephyr uh, RTOS, Zephyr RTOS, Zephyr project. 
You can also see just the number of committers by week over the life of the project. So you can just sort of see how many people are making contributions. And obviously this is a very compressed, unsmooth line chart. And, but it, it shows, hey, it's a development team and there are peaks and valleys. Mm -hmm. um, we're also tied in, it's a, it's a small number of projects, but Dave Wheeler and the Core Infrastructure Initiative have put together a badging program for essentially open source project, I call it maturity. Is that a way, to, a right way to say it, Matt, Vernon Prey? For the CII stuff? Yeah. Best yeah. Practice. Yeah. 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 You hit, you hit these higher levels, whether it's passing, I think it's passing silver gold. It's, it's, it's a badged. Uh, silver and gold. Okay. So yeah, they don't call it passing, they call it badge. I've been corrected on that a few times myself. Okay. <laughs> I was close. Um, um, but yeah. And uh, it shows you, so we just pulled from the API they provide. It shows us the last day that it was updated. Um, for what it's worth, this is the ID. Uh, that can kind of help you navigate their site because it, there is like an ID number to this. So I can kind of tell you where to go on their page. And then we also provided a link for the uh, best practices badging website, which just takes you to the Zephyr Project's actual badge on the website. And you can look at the details behind their badge and what they've met and not met, which is if, if a project, you know, if we look at the Augur project, you would see that it's 83% towards being badged. And there are some things you need to do like uh, release documents, for example, to um, get all the way up to badge, which we are not at yet. Um, current number of forks. License coverage is really important for folks interested in knowing, you know, what percentage of a project has a license in the file at all. So Zephyr, I think, is a pretty high performer. From what I've seen, it's 73.74%. And then Matt, we were looking at this yesterday. Matt also lets us download a um, the S bomb for a project, and I was going to save. I guess I saved this yesterday as well. Uh, call and that S bomb is going over here to uh, my downloads folder. I might also add that the SBOM is like a JSON file just from the DoSoc scan directly right now. But we have a lot of work that we're putting into, um, well, for one, we're going to be putting more licensing, like context for licensing information on the page is what I plan. The other part is getting the SBOM to be more um, representative of the SPDX schema. So I, right. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just saying, am I super quiet still? No. No, I hear you much better. Okay, now. gotcha. So right now the SBOM uh, contains the license part of the SPDX definition. As, as Matt explained, there's more of the SPDX definition that we're planning to add to this downloadable JSON file. Mm -hmm. And Matt, is what we, what we have so far compliant with the schema, or have, have we not verified that yet? It looks like it is, but... No, we're going to be getting some more information and an example to go off of for um, creating a document that's more representative of that. But right now, it's just how it's been for a while. Okay. Yeah, this is not, this isn't everything in SPDX. No. Yeah, I've, I've certainly seen the full SPDX files, and I know there's more than this. Oh, but yeah, the full SPDX file, even in JSON, is like 10 megabytes for something like Zephyr. So I I cut it down to the most important stuff for this part, but we can also get a full S bomb down. I, we'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah. I just I've I've had this conversation with the SPDX folks before about possibly creating a smaller version of SPDX. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That uh, it wasn't not super, super well received. <laughs> well, I just think because it creates. <laughs> Because it could create some inconsistencies. I don't know. Because you're right. I mean, it's a giant file. And, and certainly serving 10 megs isn't a huge deal, um, especially if people are running their own instances. But, um, so we could have a, a download mini SBOM and a download massive SBOM file 
and the second one, or the second one could just be with a B at the end. Like it, just, it could just be a .spdx extension and people could figure out how to text reader it. Yeah. Um, yeah. To me, that would make sense. So you could have like a re redacted version or <laughs> a reduced version. Reduced probably, yeah. Yeah, which would, and the reduce would honestly just be creator and inf uh, document information, creator information and package information. I think would really be it because the SPDX document gets enormous when you start adding information for every file. Right. That's right. where it really takes off. But those first three items, I think it'd almost be taken care of in a page. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think Matt's working on developing that still. So um, this, this page will get better and better. Okay. So I have a question about license coverage. I'm, I'm actually a little surprised that it's so low. It's 73.74 and 73%. Does that, yeah. So is that, is this just looking at the license that's declared in each file or is it also looking at licenses that apply to the entire project as a whole? Because some, some, pro, some licenses are project based and some are file based. Does this make that distinction? It, it doesn't because Kate thinks they should be defined at the file. I think David Wheeler also thinks that the licenses should be declared at the file level. To answer your question directly, no. This is just using, you can see it's just yanked out Nomos from Fasology. Okay. And it, so it's just running the Nomos scanner file by file. So it's, it's basically just dropping it into Fasology. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I'm inclined to agree with them. It's way less ambiguous if it's defined explicitly in the file. It's so much easier. But, you know, maybe a case where, Maybe somebody dropped a license file in a top level directory and said, this is it for the, <laughs> for everything oh, here. Right. It's all covered. And it is technically covered, even if it's ambiguous, not ambiguous. It's in fact, very not ambiguous. It just doesn't appear when taken out of context of the, of the license file. No. Yeah. So I, I understand your point and know that this does not do that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, if we did, if we did license scanning on Augur, we'd show a lot of MIT, but then when it scanned your Augur, Stuff or your facade stuff, it would show the GPL or the Apache 2 licenses. Yeah, which reminds me, I need to relicense that. Yeah, if you can't, if it's if it's amenable to the other contributors, that would be great. Yeah, I checked with the other contributors; they're fine. I just need to cut a release that does it. Cool. Right. Um, the one thing that the license scanner doesn't do that I think it we should probably build in is start taking a look for SPDX short identifiers. Is those start showing up? Because I don't think it'd be actually. You know, it'd be interesting, Matt, if you could run a test by um, feeding you know ten files with short identifiers at the top, and see if Nomos picks them up. Okay. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I like that. Like the um, the short. Yeah, I know what you mean. The SPDX short identifiers. I, I actually don't know really the answer to that because if it doesn't pick them up, we should take care of that. But I think it does, but it says found by Nomos on there because it says it's found it itself. Well, if, if Nomos finds it, either via a short identifier or text, it doesn't, I don't, I could care less. But if it's, for, you know what I mean? For the licenses that are not found by Nomos, how are they found? We just had this conversation. Did, you, did, I, just, did I miss that? You did. Okay. No, I mean, we just had this conversation like an hour ago upstairs. You were not there. Oh, okay. I'm like, man, I don't, I don't remember. I just don't. It's like, God, you know, it's like, I know it's been a long We really just talked about this five it's minutes ago, Sean. I'm talking to my wife now? I, I, <laughs> I totally missed that one. So Matt, do you want to talk about that? Um, the big difference that I could tell by looking through the code and seeing how it works is the explicit versus implicit identification of a license. Um, so if, if it finds it by text scraping, I, I think that's when it finds found by Nomos. And I'm going to be changing that table to, to better reflect, like more efficiently reflect whether or not it was found by a certain method. Um, but right now, by what I understand, the, it's found by Nomos if it finds a license name in the file. And if it's not, then it's just found it explicitly identified. But I'll have to, I'll have to further that and come back on that one because I don't know for sure. I mean, the reality is, is they are all found by Nomos. Yeah. Because 
that's the only tool we have. <laughs> so I don't know what else would be finding them. So is is um is maybe the difference an SPDX compliant license declaration compared to a not SPDX compliant one? That's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. So. But I, can we just get rid of that column? Because I don't even know what it provides. Well, well that it, now it, actually, yeah. If it could be changed to uh, found by SPDX declaration or found by by text scanning, I, I think those it are two interesting pieces of information, and I think that's what's here. I agree with that. If that can be determined. Okay. Yeah. Also, something I had mentioned in the chat earlier too, about five minutes ago, is that I um, I noticed that there's not much of a correlation between the the actual coverage of licenses versus uh, just one like license declaration versus like the CI best practices compliance. So, like for example, Open SSL is in the repo list that has a badge at maybe sixty two percent, and then its license coverage is like thirteen percent. Um, but that doesn't necessarily, uh, you have, I guess you have to look at it holistically and say, what are all these, what's all this information on it? Would, would it be useful to display the, the license, uh, if it exists, the license file declared in the root of a repository, which is often the, sort of the standard case? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Because I imagine that the the, nomos, the scanner is going to read that file just the same as other files, and it's usually called all cache license. Um, and it's probably in that table somewhere. It's an idea. I think we can also, if it's a GitHub repo, we can also pull it. But I don't know. We can discuss that technical detail later. And then Matt, I might also ask that you take a look at um, the work, take a look at where Nomos is right now that is being used here and where Nomos is. I don't know if you've done that lately, where Nomos is in the repository. No, I have not. So it makes sense to update our version of Nomos is what I'm hearing? Yep. And at this point, it's not really used as a worker or anything because the install is kind of involved. So um, the best thing we can do right now is to populate a database with the Algor SBOM, which we've made references to, and then use that data um, for risk in uh, the Algor that connects to that same database. That, that makes sense. Um, the, the other items that uh, we wanted to highlight is we have an upcoming release called Space Cowboy. And one of the really critical features that's included. Uh, just today, we got the automated, automated installation of our poster scheme um, implemented. And the last mile for, for this release, which we, I think we'll get to sometime next week, or before this week is over perhaps, will be the automatic letting people provide a list of repositories that they want to begin scanning and any grouping they want to put around those repositories. And essentially, at that point, someone can download Augur, install it, uh, load up their repos, and run it locally. Which is, we talked a little bit about that last week, but I just wanted to update people that we made a good deal of progress even since then. And um, the the loading the schema automatically is not um, it's not on GitHub yet. I'm still doing some local testing. I need to finish it up and make sure that it's hardy before I will push it. Um, but that should be, I only have a little bit left to do as far as that goes. Yeah. And then, this is during, this is all during installation where yeah. you can basically ask people, if you don't have the Augur schema, do you want to go get it? Is that right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And yeah, I created, I created a script that I put in the wrong place and told Carter you should organize it the way it should be. Um, yeah, and uh, so it'll be part of the install script that he runs. Okay. But, as the database guy, I, I got tired of having to create three schemas by hand, and so I wrote a script to make that easier on me, um, and I gave it to Carter. Okay. Uh, and then that kind of gets into, oops, so any, any, probably no questions about that since we didn't show you anything. You can watch last week's video if you want to see the 
last week's state of our installer, which is even way ahead of where it was at OSS North America. Um, the next item on the agenda is a little bit of a deeper dive into what we call our housekeeper project. I don't know how deep we need to go. Um, but basically, so last week we talked about we have a worker for all of our data collection. So the data collection in Augur is continuous. In Facade, Brian Warner had a Chrome job that you created and it just would run Facade every so often, check to see if the repo group had been updated in the last 24 hours, and then would run it again. Yep. Uh, we've, we've decided that Chrome is far too old, established, and stable a technology <laughs> for, for us to use. So we've created our own scheduler. Essentially, our workers run continuously. Um, and there's a housekeeper process that checks and sees if they are running. And I don't know if you want to explain a little bit more about that. Yeah, so we just try to make it as easy as possible to uh, just define uh, the type of define tasks for this housekeeper entity. Uh, and you just define the group of repos that you want data for and the type of data, which we have different data models is what we call them. And we uh, we just make it easy to put those in the config and then the housekeeper knows to uh, spin up workers and get tasks to them regularly. And what's coming up soon is just a more regulated uh, kind of heartbeat checking of the workers um, just to ensure that they're it's so no working. hiccups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rather than manually checking. Yeah. So basically, once you start a worker, it'll just keep running until you turn it off. And when you start Augur, it'll it's uh, it's configurable. But the intended use case would be that, especially if you're going to be a periodic user who installs it on your own machine, the intended use case would be that when you start Augur, it starts up the workers and begins collecting data where it left off. So we keep track of which repository the each of the workers is working on. Mm -hmm. And if you turn Augur off, to, if you're running it on your laptop and you turn it off, um, the next time you start it, it'll begin collecting wherever it left off. Yeah. So it doesn't start at the top. Like if, you, if your laptop's open eight hours a day and it takes 20 hours to run your initial uh, GitHub issue collection, it, it doesn't start over at the top mm -hmm. and, and remake all those calls. Yeah, the idea is just to make it as uh, simple and seamless and consistent and not stop until you tell it to. So, so that I mean, it sounds like it does the, the same thing that the cron job does just without bothering with cron. Is it, cron the cron job actually does exactly that. Um, it's made to recover as soon as something goes wrong. However, um, do you, how, how often are you poking the remote repos for new commits is that just basically until it's turned off or for the for the reposit for the for the repository itself the, the git repository it's configurable i think right now i have it set to something like every three days okay it'll update the repos i didn't for testing purposes i didn't think we needed daily and mm -hmm. i think um i when i initially do a collection for github issues pull requests statistics and another information that we get from GitHub, I'll make it like a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a large number of repositories with a lot of issues, it, it can just take a long time to make all those GitHub API calls uh, to pull that data in. And then I'll, I'll turn it up to be more frequent once the initial collection is done. Right now, that is a heuristic that we use. We don't have a way of signaling to people that your initial collection is done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is probably well, we plan on doing some measuring, so we kind of have a recommended delay uh, yeah. that you might want to set for particular workers. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing that we, we do with, um, so it's, you know, when you're using the GitHub ABI, how do you know that you have the right number of issues? And there's a GitHub as a metadata API that we call and populate a repo info table with. So if we want to know, if we want to, if we think that a repository's total number of issues is, is seems way off, we can look at what the GitHub metadata is returning and saying about the number of issues on that repository. And that distinguishes between issues and pull requests so that we know 
the difference. And, and so we're able to sort of gut check what we've collected against what GitHub says exists in an, in an automated way. And that's, that's part of how we trust our data. Um, because anyone that's worked with the GitHub API knows that things can get wonky or can get shut down. All of our workers are checking the rate limit remaining on the token when they make their calls. And they stop for whatever time's remaining of an hour um, since it last started before starting up again. And in that way, we don't, you know, so you don't get lost because you hit your GitHub API limit and kept like banging on it. Yeah. Um, Makes sense. And then the, the final thing I had on the agenda today was just, um, and I can't remember if we talked about this last week or not, but Gabe and Jonah, who's not here right now, have been working, Gabe's been working on something he calls the Insight Worker. And uh, Jonah's been working on a Slack bot that gets messages put to it from the Insight Worker. And the uh, way you can see it kind of initially would be to look at just the Augur dashboard and what this shows you right now is the most statistically significant outlying event in the last 90 days using a one-year period for what is normal in, in one repository. The top three, basically, if you've got five repository groups, it will show you up to three repositories, one from each group that has the most anomalous action you know, the farthest outline. Yeah, and we I have guess. a scoring system for the anomalies, and we also take recency as a factor, too, for what we uh, want to display to the user. But, but we expect in the future this will be highly configurable, so you can get anomaly detection and Slack push notifications uh, based on criteria that you define. Um, one, one that I can think of that is less, not even a computation so much as a counting exercise is, if, if I have an issue that all of a sudden has a lot more comments than any other issue, uh, I might wanna be sort of made aware of that with a Slack notification of some kind. Maybe I don't wanna see that on my dashboard, but maybe I want Slack to push a link to that issue uh, to me from Augur so that I can see what's, what's got people talking so much. Yeah, and so our Slack bot that our other worker uh, that Jonah is working on um, and the Insight Worker are interconnected. So right as the Insight Worker is discovering things, it's able to uh, send that over to the Slack bot so that um, they can notify users through Slack like, hey, it, we just found out like this issue is getting a lot more activity than others, um, so it's kind of like a signal for someone to go check it out. And I, I had a demo of that at one point, but I think right now he's working it out. So. Yeah. So, so the idea here is that, does insight equal the same thing as anomalies? It, yes. Statistically, what you're seeing, what we're showing you is anomaly. So um, when, it, when you have the insights at the top or insights on the left side, those are basically pulling out the anomalies. Is that correct? That's correct. So the Insight Worker plans on um, doing slightly more in the future. It, the Insight Worker is kind of the analysis side of Augur. So in the future, uh, you know, we hope to uh, maybe point out certain correlations of different okay. things going on okay. in the repo. Not just anomalies, but maybe other things as well. Yeah, so kind of like going off of what Brian was saying earlier with um, when a bunch of people are leaving a certain repository, mm -hmm. uh, maybe seeing a correlation between that and another repository gaining a bunch of contributors and moreover, like where those contributors match up, you know, we hope to be able to point out that kind of thing and even just point you directly to a comparison page of where those correlations can be pointed out. So this, so what I'm looking at here on the screen is you have five different groups, is that correct? Yeah, so on this instance of Augur, there are five repo groups. Five what? Repository groups. Yeah. So and then each one of those groups that go together, yeah. 
each one of those groups happens to also have five repositories. And, so, and these are the five most statistically significant anomalies. Um, so these are the five top, these are the five repositories in each repo group with the most anomalous activity. I see. So the repo group might actually have 50 repositories. Yeah, like in the case of, in the case of Apache and GraphQL, there's like Apache has over 100. I think, okay. and, and uh, GraphQL has 50 something about right. Yeah. Okay, uh, so what you're so telling me here is that, like I, it doesn't really say like to the left of the graph what the anomaly is, is that correct? Right, so we, yeah, we talked about this actually last night, like it would be nice to have like, what is this Y axis? What is this X axis? <laughs> um, As opposed uh, to just an up, <laughs> just, yeah, just have yeah. arrows pointing up. So, you know, a little bit of labeling is, is I think, uh, in order. And I think similarly, we can label these and also probably state which particular... Like, this uh, is an issue thing. This is a right. pull request thing. This is yeah. a other pull request thing. Like, maybe yeah. even at a really coarse level. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have the data, and um, we can display it. Because yeah. then I'm thinking from this insight the insight worker could push the these five items that says you have you know whatever three pull request <laughs> three pull request anomalies and two issue anomalies yeah something super simple that's a, that's yeah 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 that is and then they would come here to actually drill down a little bit obviously that would be yeah. my thought. Yep, and you, yeah, and actually each of these, it's not totally clearly indicated, but each of these is a live link to the repository. And you can see the data. We have somebody working on our style sheet so that it doesn't do this. Okay. Uh, but that, that, what I'm looking at here is just kind of the, this doesn't tell me anything about the anomaly. It's the it prior. Doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, right? Like, because it doesn't, since I didn't tell you what this anomaly was. Right. Like, the ideal scenario would be a link to a page. Like, if it's a pull request anomaly, it would link me to a page about pull requests. Or it would take me to the pull request. Uh, well, or the collect, it'd probably take the, a pull request graph um, for that page, and maybe it would enumerate pull requests that are included in the anomalous activity. Okay or something like that. And the, really the new version of the Insight Worker is able to, or, or and our database, we're storing uh, a couple of insights for every single repository in the database. So we'll be able to show like one or two insights on the repo overview page that's kind of um, signaling what's going on with this particular repo. Uh, even if it doesn't show up on the dashboard, because it may not be considered as significant compared to other insights, but we plan to allow that if you're just trying to drill down on a specific repo. Okay. Um, I really, I really, really like the push idea here a lot. I think this is something that has come up a few times um, that people, when you start getting into these dashboards, it's hard to kind of train yourself to go to those dashboards on a daily basis right? and work through that information, but. And if uh, you're responsible for a non-trivial number of repositories, it's hard to know when something, when an event is occurring, that's out of the ordinary. Yeah. Without doing a lot of scanning and this particular worker does do that for you. Yeah, and it's just, and all it's saying is these are the top five most, like, most significantly different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If we give you a little bit more information about what's different, then you may be able to know whether you're curious or not yes. based on what's said there. Like, and then you get into know that's happening anyway. Right. Okay. No, I, I really, really like I really like this idea of push push notifications. So I, I knew you would because it was an idea that you you arrived at when we talked well, about this just summer. by listening to people. So it's a yeah. And, and we both read Simon again this summer, so. Um, <laughs> you gotta help people. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta bound their rationality. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, well, I think we're um, near the end of time. Are there any, any final requests or questions?
Oh yeah, I got one. Right. Um, so, are you guys going to like update that instrument instruction? Because for myself, I was trying to you know to install, but facing some like errors while trying to you know connect to the database. Yeah, we're. Uh, are you in the dev branch, Patrick? I think I emailed you last night. Yeah, uh, that that was was where I was actually. Yeah, Car Carter is uh, working on that right now, and okay. and the, like I, I mentioned in the call, we've got the schema creation automated, uh, or nearly. It's 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 automated, and now Carter is making it part of the script. And okay. the final mile is that you'd be able to provide a list of repositories that can be loaded in, and then. It'll start the workers up for you. Okay, that um, sounds cool. And another thing is like, when I create my database, it looks like I have to use that SQL code to create a schema, right? Yeah, it's right now we're distributing a Postgres schema. We do mm -hmm. we do have SQL Alchemy, um, okay. you underneath the hood doing a, doing some work, but we haven't embraced entirely the the notion of a uh, database engine portable schema mostly because we're, we're you know we don't have infinite resources and so we, we postgres is a pretty solid database it can run nicely on a local machine without killing it and so it's performant um and that's that's why we picked it um it can, you can use it on a large scale you can use it on a small scale and and so we it is all po po Postgres is the underlying physical database for Augur right now and you need support. But a lot of the API, if you look at the Augur DB in the API docs, we're using a lot of SQL Alchemy for accessing the database when we're showing you reports. All right, okay, I see. And one last question, it looks like the support email, like uh, if you want to report some issue or something, uh, that Slack email is no longer active. Oh. Uh, I mean, it, I was trying to, you know, email from that link, but it looks like it's not working anymore. Oh, um, let me check and make sure what's going on there. Um, certainly the best way to create an issue is to just open an issue. Okay. Um, but if you're having, for installation support, we do have a Slack channel. And uh, Sean, just wondering if Sean loaded that Slack channel on the latest build of his laptop or not. Um, so we'll figure that out. We will, we will fix that link for sure. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. If that's not working, then yeah. that's a problem. That's definitely supposed to be working. <laughs> okay. Got it. Yeah. It, it does look well. If, for one thing, it, it might very well be working, but I don't have it in my. Yeah. Slack reinstalled itself and took away a bunch of my channels. And I'm not quite sure what I did wrong, but uh, I will fix that. Okay, but if we are, like I will face, face more problem, maybe I just open an issue. Yes. That was, that's, that's yeah. Really and since you're actively trying to get it installed, you, you can, you can email me, you know, we don't, it's not like we have a million people trying to install Augur right now and we can learn a lot from people who are trying to. So, um, I would, I would say, um, maybe I think the best, thing to do would be to wait for us to get the schema population piece done, which I'm confident will be done in the next week and might be done this week. Uh, and then, then it will be much, much easier to install. It will also update the docs and uh, notify of a, a release to master. All right. That's great that, to know. That has cool. that. We're very, very close. We have like I think three issues left on our, on our release calendar before we okay. release. Cool. All right. Well, with that, I think we're a little bit over time. So thank you, everyone, for your interest. And uh, we'll be here every week at this time. Um, join us as frequently as you have the time and are finding it interesting. Thanks, John. Thanks, guys. Thanks, yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.